So I would like to call our next speaker, Anna Era. So hello everybody. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for organizing this really wonderful conference. I'm very honored um, to be here, and I think you did a marvelous job of honoring uh, and celebrating Professor Knobloch. So the talk of today is focused on my research on the visualization of astronomical knowledge which developed from my doctoral thesis that Eberhard Knobloch supervised. My dissertation was published in 2020 and it dealt with the vernacular German discourse on comets in the 16th and 17th centuries. In recent years, I um, particularly engaged with uh, the visual dimension of the pamphlets and broadsheets on comets, and today I want to show you some examples of these sources. So, but first, allow me some time for some personal uh, reflection. So, I'm here today because Eberhard Knobloch was my beloved professor and my mentor. So I began studying history of science at the TU Berlin 20 years ago, and I soon began to admire Eberhard Knobloch for his uh, unique style of teaching, for how he brilliantly made complex concepts understandable, but most importantly for the way he was able to let others see and feel his own enthusiasm. So his fascination was as genuine as it was um, contagious, and I obviously understood early on why an astrolabe or the invention of the calculus was um, beliebig großartig. I became his uh, student assistant and I started to support his various academic endeavors at the TU and also at the Akademie der Wissenschaften. I remember also various Christmas parties where you would prepare your famous Feuerzangenbowle, which we all enjoyed. Um, I also remember very many interesting field trips, one of them to the Archenholzsternwarte. And this picture here in the middle was um, exactly taken 10 years and one day ago because it was uh, at your 70th birthday celebration at the Archenholzsternwarte, which is the place where I'm working now. So later on, you became my doctor father. You were actively guiding my research, helping me with various problems, offering insights and inspiration, and teaching me many invaluable grammar lessons, for which I'm very thankful. But most importantly, you were a great voice of support and encouragement. For example, when I decided to not have one, but three kids during my PhD, and you would tell me stories uh, about the time when you were working on your thesis, juggling some books and a kid child on your lap. So that was very inspirational. So in his impressive career, Ivar Knudler worked on a multitude of topics. Obviously, I don't have the time to go into any details here. Um, what you see here is only a tiny, tiny fraction of his books some of whose production I supported. But I think it's clear from this very small selection that Ivar Knobloch often devoted his effort and expertise to understanding the works of some of the most important and praised figures in the history of science. For example, Leibniz, Humboldt, or Kepler. I think what he wrote himself in the epilogue to Kepler's epitome is not too unfitting to be applicable to his own writing. Um, which often impress, I quote here, through eine Sauberkeit der Darstellung, Klarheit der Sprache und Beweisführung und durch die innere Lebendigkeit, ja die verborgene Leidenschaft des Forschers, selbst im trockensten Gegenstand. So instead of focusing on the heroes of science, I in my research rather concentrated on the formation and popularization of a form of bottom-up knowledge, since um, I relied on vernacular pamphlets, mostly as my main genre of sources. So my talk deals with the subject of communication of knowledge, especially through images. So for today, I chose a topic where mathematics and visualization most clearly meet, which is the topic of diagrams. So 
Whitehead said that mathematics is a science of structure, <coughs> therefore it can be visually represented. In the case of comets, visualizing knowledge is extremely important. You can see here three types of, um, of ways how cometary knowledge was visualized. So on the left you have a, a horoscope chart that's basically an activity of a, a comet indicating the positions of celestial bodies and the comet itself in the framework of the 12 astrological houses. Then in the middle you see a visualization of a method of observation. Here you see a representation of the spatial relation between the comet and the sun by uh, Petrus Appian, something that was later considered a physical law about the anti-solarity of the comet's tail. And here is something you all have seen, <coughs> models of the world. So here is a model of the geocentric cosmos with the terrestrial and celestial spheres represented by concentric circles. So today, I chose um, three examples representing a different and maybe a new type of diagrams on comets. Namely, the first attempts to visualize the apparent course of a comet on representations of the celestial sphere containing actual star positions. So my first example is from uh, Paulus Fabricius. He was the court astronomer um, to Emperor Charles V in um, <coughs> uh, Vienna. Then in the middle, it's, uh, it's the frontispiece of a pamphlet by Johannes Lebenstreit. He was the town physician uh, and professor of mathematics in Erfurt. And then a pamphlet from uh, Joachim Heller. He was also a <coughs> professor for mathematics and the official calendar maker um, of Nuremberg. So we know of uh, <coughs> publications on the 1556 comet from Paulus Fabricius. This on the left is the Latin uh, broadsheet. Then there was a German broadsheet uh, with the same visualization, but this is unfortunately not <coughs> today. And then on the right you see here a German pamphlet in quarter format. It shows the same visual, but as you can see, much uh, smaller and more simple. So I copied here um, two sentences from the sources that refer to the visual. Fabricius calls it a pictura, or gemelde, of the comet's course, and he says that he provides the actual positions of the comet in relation to the numbered days on which he observed it in Vienna. So this is a segment of a star chart based on a projection of the northern ecliptical hemisphere, colored and labeled. It displays actual positions and magnitudes of the stars according to Ptolemy's catalog. We see the comet's cores plotted here on the star map uh, through 14 depictions. They indicate the positions of the comet as observed on particular days. At least roughly also the optical appearance of the comet is portrayed. So its size, its um, figure, and the length of the tail. The comet's path is um, displayed as an abstract visualization of observed position. So it gives the impression of a continuous movement. This can be described as um, a graph or curve, um, since it represents a relationship between coordinates <coughs> and displays a series of measurements. This, for example, um, allowed Fabricius to compensate for missing data. For example, on days when, when, he, when it wasn't possible to observe the comet, he could extrapolate its position based on this graph. And he did this for the 4th and 13th of March, which are the positions where no uh, number is given. So Fabricius' diagram was most probably and quite accurately modeled after Dürer's famous star map of 1550. Um, you all know this map, so I don't need to go into detail. Um, it was the result of collaborative efforts of Dürer, who made the woodcuts um, of the constellation figures, Johannes Stavius, who arranged um, the chart, and Konrad Heinfogel, who provided the actual star positions. This form of celestial cartography was something completely new and innovative. 
as it comprised printed planispherical maps with coordinates and scales from which star positions could be plotted. This map did not offer an exact image of the sky over Nuremberg, but rather a calculated and imagined order of the sky. Fabricius does not mention that he used Dürer's map. For sure, it was the most sophisticated and precise star chart of his time, and it was most suitable for his purposes. So how can we tell? We can tell, first of all, by the orientation of the map, by the position, by the magnitude, and the distance of the stars, which are very, very similar, if not the same. I think one could even say that he, um, in German you would say, abhausen, that he put one on the other and really uh, made it uh, after, uh, after the star chart of, of Dura. And we can also see it from the sequence of the zodiac signs. They represent the bird's eye view of the celestial sphere. So now my second example is the Thomas Bees of Hebenstreit's uh, track that was published in Wittenberg. It shows the celestial sphere with stars and circles and zodiac signs, and we see 12 depictions of the comet representing its course. If you look closely, you can see here and here, you can see mounds or holding bars depicted. So I think what is visualized here is not a sphere, but a globe. This globe is surrounded by allegorical representations of the planets Mercury, Saturn, and Mars, depicted with their <coughs> typical attributes and the associated zodiac signs. Um, at this time, comets were understood as consisting of terrestrial vapors that would ascend to the upper regions of air and would be ignited there. This process was seen as being guided by, but also initially caused, um, by the influence of celestial bodies, particularly planets or eclipses of planetary aspects. Hemstreit in the text identified an opposition between Saturn and Mars, who also were the ruling planets of that year's eclipse, as the malicious configurations to have caused this comet. And based on the comet's color, he concluded that it was primarily of the nature of Saturn and Mercury and to a lesser extent uh, of the nature of Mars, which also was in conjunction with Mercury and Saturn. So hence you can see here um, the spatial arrangement of the figures. Saturn and Mercury are the main rulers of the comet and they are both touching the comet's head with their staffs, uh, which is iconographically representing their causal role in the formation of the comet. Mars is depicted um, spatially connected to both, symbolizing the conjunction, but his position lying on the ground reflects his inferior role in causing the comet's appearance. I think Hebenstreit modeled his visualization after Fabricius. He did not systematically observe the comet himself, and he gives a rather qualitative um, description of its course um, in the text. The first position of the comet that he offers is um, the eighth degree of Libra, which is exactly the value that Fabricius gives. And Himstreit mentions some stars or constellations next to which the comets move, for example, Arthur and Ursa, Major and uh, Minor. I think we can see uh, Arthur on Hebenstreit celestial uh, sphere, but the constellations of the two Ursa are missing or misplaced. Fabricius also showed uh, 14 depictions for the comet, in Hebenstreit only 12. And furthermore, the line that connects the comet's head on Hebenstreit's uh, um, visualization is straight. So I think what he did is he took two positions, maybe the first that he knew of, uh, which, for which he had the exact value, um, and then one more, and then he just connected them with a straight line, and then he added in some more positions. Furthermore, when we count the number of um, zodiac lines, there are too many here in Hebenstreit's uh, depiction. It doesn't add up. So 
I think he failed to correctly transfer the planispherical map of Fabricius to the celestial sphere or globe that he wanted to present. Also, the order of the zodiac signs is reversed. And this inversion of left and right is exactly what happens in the printing process. So the woodcutter traced the original star map on the wood block with the correct orientation. And then the printed image appears um, reversed. An alternative explanation could be that the image was reversed on purpose to designate a particular view or perspective of the sky. So Dura's star map shows a, sp a perspective on the celestial sphere from the outside, the bird's eye view. And that results in a specific order of the zodiac signs and also usually means that we see all constellations from the back sides. That was the usual way um, employed on contemporary maps and globes, but there are exceptions. One exception is Apian. He sometimes favored the so-called terrestrial or geocentric perspective, the view from the inside to the outside, so to speak. So in his observational report um, on the comet of 1532, um, we can see this perspective, and actually it makes total sense because we see Apian observing. He's measuring the comet with his instruments. So the spectator of the image shares the observer's point um, of view and his perspective. This perspective is also employed here by Victorin Schoenfeld in a pamphlet on the comet of 1558. This is a celestial sphere similar to the one of Hebenstreit, but here the number of lines is correct, cardinal directions are correct, <coughs> and from the order of the zodiac signs we can infer that this um, portrays the inside view or uh, the, the view of the terrestrial observer. <coughs> So one could argue that this is a form of visual innovation, maybe triggered by the increasing importance assigned to observation in general, but also to comet observations in particular at this time. So interestingly, the Austrian astronomer Karl von Nitro discovered Fabrizio's comet chart and thought that it was inverted by the printing process. He said, I present here an exact copy of this map in which, as often happened in those times, the inversion of the image through the printing process has been taken into account in the writing, but not in the regions of the world. So I have reversed the image in the present copy against the original, so that the same agrees with the meaning <coughs> of the sky. So Littrow is apparently not aware that the bird's eye view from the outside was the usual way of portraying the celestial sphere in Fabricius's time. Whereas we might believe that Himstreit's terrestrial view mm -hmm. is the result of a printing error, or maybe a purposeful reversal of the perspective as a result from measuring and observing comets in a new way. Littrow was not the only one interested in the 1556 comet. Already in the 18th century, Edmund Halley and Alexander Pingré noticed similarities between the comet of uh, 1264 and the one of 1556, and they concluded that um, they referred to the same periodic comet. Based on this calculation, Pingré predicted the comet's return in 1848. Then this didn't happen, and John Russell Hind repeated the orbit determination and suggested that maybe the orbit could have been strongly perturbed by uh, Saturn and Neptune. In 1849, Bastian Bommel attempted an accurate perturbation calculation, and he predicted the return of the comet between 1856 and 1861. But as the story goes, an unknown German astrologer chose the arbitrary date of 1857 for the return of the comet and speculated that it would cause the end of the world on the 13th of June. This expectation quickly stood up a mass hysteria, particularly here in Paris, um, which is nicely reflected in a series of popular prints. I show you here some examples by Honoré Daumier. So he intelligently poked fun at the whole 
incident and the reactions that created. So anyhow, the comet of 1857, it never came. So what happened? The answer was provided by Martin Hook. He could prove conclusively that the comets of 1264 and 1556 were just not identical. And Hook's advantage was that he knew the account of Littrow that was published in 1856. And Littrow, he did not only find the original diagram of Fabricius' observations in the state's archive of uh, Vienna, but he also found a hitherto unknown pamphlet by Joachim Heller. And this is my third example. This is a so-called practica, a prognostical work for the year uh, 1557. It shows um, the visualization of the course of the comet, and you can immediately see that the path is much longer than on Fabricius' um, um, map. So indeed, Heller observed the comet carefully until well into April and gives a detailed report about this observation in his text. He gives the comet positions in latitudes and longitudes for 53 days of uh, his observation and he describes the comet's motion in relation to significant stars and constellations. The celestial sphere here is shown from the outside. The Earth and some observers are in the center, and depicted are also celestial circles, some zodiac signs, and a few stars and constellations. <coughs> he writes, as regards this comet's course, I was careful to notice, either at its rising or on the meridian, or by known stars, a certain reference points of its visible position in the sky. I trust that the learned will have particularly enough in this account for calculating the comet's real course. So it was indeed Heller's intention to provide precise and useful observational data as the basis for calculating the comet's course. We have to note, though, that the primary motivation behind these efforts, most probably, was the desire to provide a sound astrological interpretation, to a great part based on observable parameters. All three authors I showed you today offered this astrological interpretation, in particular to, uh, in relation to the comet's course and motion. I actually doubt that this um, diagram was very useful to infer from it precise comet locations so because there is no proper numerical scale and only a very few stars as reference points. Interestingly, Heller's illustration is neither a map nor a globe, but it rather resembles an armillary sphere. So diagrams have often been studied in relation to scientific practices and material culture, emphasizing that these visualizations cannot be studied independently of their context of uh, production and use. For these three examples I showed you today, I think the culture of print is an important context. So transferring the complex display of, of an observational report to a woodblock and then onto paper proved to be very challenging for Himmelstreit. The question of the perspective on the sky is an issue directly related to the process of printing. But I also want to present a different dimension of material culture relevant in these examples, and this, uh, these are instruments. All these three diagrams relate to a contemporary important astronomical instrument. So for Fabricius, it is the planisphere or star chart. For Hebenstreit, it is the celestial globe, and I put here an example of Johannes Schöner. And for Heller, it was the armillary sphere. All three instruments are important tools of astronomy fulfilling various heuristic, expository, and didactic functions, and they are aids of observation and representation. I think they vividly reflect the growing emphasis put on measurement and precision in addition to the emphasis on the importance of observation. And all three authors wanted to communicate this. <coughs> so these first attempts to visualize 
the observed chorus of a comet on a celestial sphere suggests evidence. They underline the astronomer's competence and they ascribe legitimacy to the accounts of the comets and the interpretation, especially the astrological interpretation. These diagrammatical images, so to say, they function as paper tools. They not merely communicate, explain, and represent existing knowledge, but they generate new goals, new objects and concepts linked to them. I think they reflect the growing emphasis put on measurement and precision, mirroring a new conception of rigor and accuracy. They help to establish a methodology and a way to approach visualizing this methodology and its results. So before I'm going to end my talk, to thank all of you, <coughs> Professor Knubloch, I want to thank you once more for being my teacher, for being my professor, for being my mentor. I'm very, very, very thankful for everything you did for me. I'm honored and happy to be here. And I say once more, congratulations. <laughs> and <I'm> <laughs>